Recently, KitGuru looked at three MSI motherboards to give you an idea of what kind of features you get for how much money if you're building a PC around an AMD Zen 4 processor, such as this Ryzen 9 7950X. But of course, you might not be using AMD. You might be using Intel. In this instance, a Core i9-14900K. Here we have three MSI motherboards that support LGA 1700 with DDR5 and the very latest Intel processors. We have three Intel motherboards on the bench and then neatly separated by features. At the bottom end of the scale, we have the Mag B760 Tomahawk Wi-Fi, which sells for 200 pounds. In the middle, we have the MPG Z790 Edge Ti Max Wi-Fi, and that's a long name. That sells for £300, however, it was initially on sale at £370, but you can find it discounted to £300 absolutely everywhere. And at the top of the stack, we have this Meg Z790 Ace Max. That's expensive. That's £630. As the names suggest, this model has a B760 chipset, while these two have a Z790 chipset. So we're going to want to see, does the B760 actually support a Core i9-14900K? And why is there such a gulf in pricing between two Z790 models? And let us start with the Mag B760 Tomahawk Wi-Fi. Before we look at the details of the motherboard, let's first look at the B760 chipset side of things. Intel has three 700 series chipsets that support 14th gen and indeed 13th and 12th gen processors. They are from the top of the stack Z790, in the middle H770 and then B760. The Z790 has a list price of $57, the H770 is $37 and the B760 is $31. We don't expect expect the motherboard manufacturers pay anything like those prices, but it gives you an idea of the separation. Technically, the Z790 is more than 20 bucks more expensive than the B760. The silicon for the three chipsets appears to be effectively identical and then features have been fused off. It's worth being crystal clear, a lot of the features of your PC will come from the processor, including memory support and also PCI Express for your graphics. If your motherboard supports DDR4 rather than DDR5, that's a choice of the motherboard manufacturer. And then you come to things like USB support, and that's down to the chipset. The lower down the scale the chipset is, the less USB it has, also the less PCI Express it has. And this leads to some interesting conundrums. If we look at SCAN just as a representation of what's on sale in the UK, we can see that B760 motherboards tend to be quite cheap. H770 boards, are just non-existent. And then as we move up to Z790 motherboards, you can buy mini ATX, micro ATX, cheap ATX, and expensive ATX. The ACE that we'll be looking at shortly is at the expensive end of the scale, but there are such things as cheap Z790 motherboards. So why would you buy a B760 rather than a Z790? Common sense says if you've got two motherboards priced the same and the motherboard manufacturers have to pay more for the Z790 chipset than the B760, even if it is only a few dollars, you'd hope that at the same price point, the B760 would have better quality hardware than a budget Z790. As soon as you move to the mid-range, I've got little doubt the Z790 should come into its own. You also need to look closely at whether the motherboard manufacturer is actually pushing the limits with, for example, USB support. Have they got a basic Z790 that actually has no features and really all you're buying is the Z part of the equation? Let us take a look at this 200 pound motherboard, starting with the contents of the box. which are absolutely rock bottom. Some paperwork, two SATA cable, one SATA cable, Wi-Fi antennae, and a quick release for an M.2. And then we come to the motherboard itself, which at first glance looks absolutely fine. ATX form factor, with a cutout here by the laid down SATA connectors. Uh, that's just for aesthetic reasons, I imagine. Black in color, got some white accents. The VRMs are 12 by 75 amp. We have a two part heat sink, which is standard extruded aluminium. The primary M.2 has a heat sink, and then we have the second and third M.2s, which have one long heat sink. The three M.2s are all Gen 4. 
metal reinforcements around the primary graphics slot, but there is something of an oddity with the PCI Express. So the primary is PCI Express Gen 5 by 16, the secondary is PCI Express Gen 3 by 16, and then the little expansion slot at the bottom is Gen 4 by 1. And then we turn to the rear I.O. and the internal ports and connectors. On the rear panel, we have a USB-C, which is USB 3.2, 20 gigabit per second. We also have an internal type C, which is 10 gigabits per second. And on the rear panel, four type A's that are 10 gigabits per second. Internally, there are two USB 3's, which support five gigabit per second. And then on the rear panel, we have four USB 2's. The ethernet is 2.5 gigabit, and the wireless is Wi-Fi 6E. Moving on to the MPG Z790 Edge Ti Max Wi-Fi. And in the box, paperwork, two SATA cables, some extension cables, a USB drive which has drivers on, two securing screws for M.2s, and a Wi-Fi antenna that has an extension cable so it sits away from your PC, where the B760 has just a little stick antenna coming out of the rear I.O. And then we have the motherboard itself, ATX in form factor, and a combination of black and white with whatever colour we're going to say this is. Honestly not sure, but I like it, and that's the main thing. The layout of the board is conventional. The primary reinforced slot is PCI Express Gen 5 by 16. The slot at the bottom is Gen 4 by 16. The tiddler there, Gen 3 by 1. Under the extensive heat sinks, we have five M.2 slots. One is Gen 5 and four a Gen 4. We have six laid down SATA. I didn't even mention the SATA with the B760. There are four on that board. Here we have six, because realistically, people tend to use, I'd think, one or two SATAs these days. M.2 for the win, one or two SATAs good, six SATAs, bit over the top. But they're there, and there's no harm in that. The VRMs are 16 by 90 amps, and we have an extensive aluminium heat sink joined together with a heat pipe. The PCB is six layer, we have eight PWM fan headers, and there are three digital RGB connectors and one conventional 12 volt RGB. And then we turn to the rear I.O. and the internal expansion. On the panel we have one USB-C rated at 20 gigabits per second and one USB-C rated at 10 gigabits per second, along with four Type A's rated at 10 gigabits per second. Internally, there's another USB-C rated at 10 gigabits per second. There are four USB Type A's rated at 5 gigabits per second and an internal connector for two more USB Type A's rated at the same 5 gigabits per second. Internally, there are four USB 2's we have no USB 2s on the rear panel. Ethernet is 2.5 gigabit and the wireless is Wi-Fi 7. The Meg Z790 Ace Max tells us plenty about itself just by looking at the accessories. Bits of paperwork, put those to one side. We have five M.2 securing screws, a USB drive with drivers, a load of extension cables for RGB and sensors, and four SATA cables. Also, antenna for the Wi-Fi 7. And then we have these two cables, which are DisplayPort to Thunderbolt. So they go from your graphics card to your motherboard to give you Thunderbolt pass-through. But just look at the board itself. It is E80X in form factor, has a huge VRM arranged on three sides of the CPU socket, 24 times 105 amp stages and the VRM cooler is absolutely mighty. We have dual PCI Express 5x16 slots, both reinforced, and also a PCI Express 4x16, also reinforced. We have a load of heat shielding which covers M.2s. One is Gen 5, the other four are Gen 4. The space around the periphery of the board is crammed with connectors. We have eight PWM fan connectors, micro buttons at the foot of the board, and a debug display in the corner between the EPS connectors, the power connector, and the extra power connector. And then we turn to the rear I.O. panel. On the rear panel we have two Thunderbolts rated at 40 gigabits per second 
with their mini display port pass-throughs. Internally, we have two Type-C's rated at 20 gigabits per second. On the panel, we have one Type-C rated at 10 gigabits per second and seven Type-A's rated at 10 gigabits per second. Internally, we have four USB Type-A's rated at five gigabits per second and four USB 2.0's. Ethernet is dual two and a half gigabit and the wireless is Wi-Fi 7. In short, we have a huge array of features and the question of where does all the money go is pretty much self-explanatory. Let's start our testing with the Mag B760 Tomahawk Wi-Fi. The hardware in our test bench, the processor is an Intel Core i9-14900K, CPU cooler is an MSI MagCore Liquid E360. For memory, we're using 32GB of G-Skill Trident Z5 RGB, DDR5-6000. Graphics card is an MSI RTX 4080 Gaming AX Trio. Power supply is an MSI Meg AI-1300P. We can see the BIOS sets the power limits for the processor, both for PL1 and PL2, to 4095 watts, which essentially is infinite. In Cinebench R23, the processor power draw is 350 watts, P cores running at 5.5 GHz, E cores at 4.3 GHz. Package temperature for the processor, 100 degrees, in other words, it's thermally limited. The PC is drawing 520 watts at the wall socket. And the Cinebench R23 run comes to an end with an impressive score of 38,093. In the Speedway graphics test, the MSI RTX 4080 Gaming X Trio runs at 2.7 GHz, and the final score is 7,326. Next up, we have the MPG Z790 Ti Max Wi Fi. Power limit again set to 4,095 watts, however, this time the V core is higher at 1.37 volts. The CPU is receiving a mighty 358 watts and in Cinebench R23 at the wall socket the PC is drawing 560 watts. P cores are running at 5.67 gigahertz, E cores at 4.4 gigahertz. Ambient is 20 degrees. Will you be surprised to hear? Package temperature 100 degrees. I've just realised I failed to check the VRM temperatures with the Mag B760 Tomahawk Wi-Fi, so that's annoying. With this MPG Z790 Edge Ti Max Wi-Fi pulling this crazy amount of power at the CPU, the VRMs eventually hit 94 Celsius, which is hot, but not intolerable. And as the Cinebench R23 run finishes, we see a score a shade under 40,000. That's a huge number. In the Speedway graphics test, we once again see our GPU running at 2.7 GHz and the system's pulling 440 watts at the wall socket. The score comes in exactly on target at 7300. Our third motherboard is the MEG Z790 Ace Max and once again the power is set to infinite 4095 watts. The CPU is set to 365 watts on auto, so again we're seeing 560 watts at the wall socket. P cores running at 5.7 GHz, E cores at 4.4 GHz. In other words, the same as the Z790 Edge Ti Max Wi-Fi. The ambient's still 20 degrees and the package temperature is 100 degrees. The impressive thing here is the VRM temperatures. At the end of a 10 minute Cinebench R23 run, they're sitting at 67 degrees. If you recall, the Z790 Edge Ti Max Wi-Fi ran the VRMs up to 94 in the same test. That's a huge difference. And the final score in Cinebench R23, 40,536. We performed the Speedway graphics test one last time to confirm that graphics performance is absolutely fine on the Meg Z790 Ace Max. And indeed it is, just as we'd expect. And what can we conclude from looking at these three motherboards? Well, one thing which I have harked on about in a number of my motherboard reviews over the past few years is I don't much like the way that manufacturers push the power limits of CPUs beyond what I consider sane. I think James said something similar recently when he was looking at the uh, i9-14900KS. Personally, I would tune the bias settings of any of these boards and also motherboards from MSI's competitors and I'd bring down the power limits to something close to Intel's stock figures. Having said that, it is quite impressive to me that even the B760 Tomahawk Wi-Fi is able to run the i9-14900K up to its thermal limit. I was also quite impressed by the way the Z790 Edge Ti Max Wi-Fi behaved. 
That's got a lot going for it, but there's no doubt the showstopper here is the way that the Meg Z790 Ace Max ran those VRMs at such a low temperature, just about 30 degrees cooler than the Edge Ti. Really impressive. As I say, however, were you to tune the BIOS settings, all the figures would become much more sensible. Of that, I'm quite certain. However, I'm confident that what we've really established here is it's the features that distinguish one motherboard from another. How many expansion slots do you need? How many M.2s do you want? Do you really need 22 phases of VRM with the most stonking cooling you've ever seen? Or could you just perhaps point a fan in the general direction? of the VRM heat sinks to help things along. And that's it. In one video we looked at three motherboards for the mainstream AMD user and now we've looked at you Intel folks. I hope you're all feeling the love.